get started. We have Don Wallace, started as a dairy farmer, went on to work for Pick and Save Grocery Manager, Assistant Manager, Store Manager for several years. He then worked for Quick Trip and managed the, two sto the second store in the company, supervised 17 stores for five years, and made the Million Dollar Club in District Profit. Now in his 13th year at Martin Brothers as a culinary and retail consultant, creating proprietary food service programs for new businesses, from equipment and kitchen design to recipe creation, profit analysis, training and portion control, and covers the state of Wisconsin. Don is on the culinary team at Martin Brothers and helps develop recipes and ideas that are trending up in the industry and helps his customers to be more profitable. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming this morning. You know, I uh, sit up at night and think, gosh, I wonder if there's gonna be two or 12 or anybody. Anyway, happy to see all of you here uh, this morning. I guess as she said, I'm Don Wallace. I'm a culinary consultant with Martin Brothers Distributing. Uh, we are a family owned business in our 80th year and third generation. We're out of Cedar Falls, Iowa, although I live in Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin. Anybody know where that is? All right. Soldiers Grove, you, you can get there from here, but it's not easy. My hometown is Richland Center, actually. I, I farmed five farms, and uh, not me, but my family, and milked over 100 cows. So I understand what work is. Uh, I left part of myself at the farm. So anyway, uh, this is the third generation, Brooke and Jeff Martin. Grandpa Martin started uh, with restaurant supplies out of his garage, and we've grown to uh, close to a billion dollar company. We are employee owned, and the Martins take pretty good care of us, so it's a little different environment than you may be used to with uh, the bigger companies. We're going to talk today about restaurant profitability nationally, uh, you know, averages three to five percent after expenses are basically a nickel on every dollar, but it can range from zero or below zero to 15 percent. We had a speaker recently talk to us at our our uh, company meeting who had three restaurants in the Des Moines, Iowa area and he was tickling 15 percent. Super good guy, super smart guy, uh, knew how to handle his employees. Uh, his turnover was low because he cared about each and every person, understood their kids, their, you know, their families and uh, so he was a great inspiration to uh, in this day of constant turnover in our business. I watch QSRs, quick serve restaurants. I look at Panera Bread, uh, Arby's. You know, Arby's coming from, and I've been on the road for many, many years, so I'm doing drive-bys, eating with my one hand and steering with my knee, um, going down the road. So I do use QSRs occasionally when I'm not at my customers, but you know, Arby's was just a roast beef sandwich and curly fries six or seven years ago. The company that owns Arby's now owns Jimmy John's, Buffalo Wild Wings, and Sonic, which Sonic is more of a southern thing with the drive up. Uh, but anyway, I've watched them grow uh, and, and I do pay attention to what they're doing because trends that happen in that business also happen in our business eventually. One of our biggest customers in the state of Wisconsin is the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I consult for them. I learn from them. Uh, you know, I, I joked, I taught a culinary class for a few different groups there. and. Being from a farm town, I, they were talking about sustainable items, very important to them. Um, they've been, uh, they take California, East Coast and West Coast trends, 
and institute them in their restaurants for the kids. I can call them kids because I have grandkids. But what we see in our rural areas happens there three years ago. Okay, so they were talking about the next sustainable item that they would like to see is grasshopper and cricket flower. Everybody got that? Grasshopper and cricket flower. Why? Because you can raise grasshoppers and crickets, they're very sustainable. And so, you know, we're, we're already into almond and you know, coconut and a, a number of different flowers, but that was their next thing they hoped to see. I joked with the class that in Richland Center, we just found out about hummus a couple weeks ago. So, you know, I mean, we're getting there, but, but we're going to be a little bit behind the trends. Uh, and we'll talk about trends a little bit. But, but quick serve restaurants or fast food nationally run from six to nine percent profit. They got a lot of buying power because they might have 300 locations or, or 2,000 locations. Um, they have set menus, set ways, set procedures like McDonald's. This is the way that burger is going to taste whether you go to uh, Madison or, or North Dakota. It, that burger is going to be exactly the same. Full service restaurants generally, generally run lower because of the number of employees it takes to service the customers. So when you have a full blown restaurant with a hostess in the front, with waitresses, with busboys, more hands touching that food, that automatically is going to take your labor higher. Uh, bars, ice cream and pizza shops, etc., should be higher. And that's part of what I help to set up. Uh, and and we can we'll talk about that. I don't want to sound too salesy. Remember, I'm a consultant, not a commission salesman. Okay, those guys are different. So I want to disseminate a little bit between gross profit margin, gross profit margin, and what you have left after all deducting all the costs of good uh, sold. So retail minus food costs. Um, in my examples that I do for my customers, I include everything that the customer touches. So I include a napkin, I include condiments, I include worst case scenario on what you offer, free lettuce, onions, you know, anything that, that touches that food and, and the customer takes it with them. Net profit margin is when you deduct all of the costs of running your business from your gross profit, and that includes administrative payroll, utilities, rent or mortgage, maintenance, taxes, insurance. Uh, so if you're spending 93 cents of every dollar you bring in, you're at about a seven cent profit. Uh, so some of you wish you were at a 7% profit, and some of you are exceeding that. but you know, it's not an easy business. And so we hope that you pick up a few things today that help you go back and think about your opportunities and talk about price changes. Now is a great time to change your prices. If you're gonna do it off season, going into the next season, now is a great time to do it. I evaluate menus regularly for customers. I, if you're our prime, or if we are your prime vendor, and I understand your, your case cost, your unit cost, your ounce cost, your recipes, I will bring a scale with me and scale pizzas, how you make them, that kind of thing. Um, we can give you to the penny what you have in everything. And I think that's a good thing to know because surprisingly, a lot of you, a lot of people I run into are very hard workers. They do a very good job, have very good food, but they don't truly understand their food costs. So it, it, to me, it really starts with your, with your menu. Costs change constantly. You have commodity items out there, whether it's chicken or cheese or beef or whatever it might be, those prices fluctuate. And it's important to know that when something goes up, you have the ability 
to change your retails regularly. And when I say regularly, at least do it annually. I have done, I have done menus that haven't been changed for five years. And if you had a 3% cost of living increase in the last five years, that's 15%. 15% of your, what started out to be a 35% food cost, right, is now up to a 50% food cost. So now instead of making 65%, you're making 50%. And your labor hasn't gone down, and your utilities haven't gone down, your expenses haven't gone down, your turnover hasn't decreased, probably. So you really need to you know, look at your menus at least annually. I encourage you to do that. In your business, as I understand it, you have a lot of transient customers, right? You're not serving necessarily local customers. In your bars and restaurants, you, you will be for some of it. And if you raise the price of a hamburger, guess what? Fred's going to be angry. Everybody's worried about Fred. Don't worry about Fred. You know, you've got costs to cover. You've got business to, to, to do and a living to make. So you're always going to, no matter what you guys all know in this room, no matter what you do, you're not going to make everyone happy. There's no way. Try going to a nursing home sometime. We do a lot of nursing homes. And I'll throw a chef's coat on, and I'll cook a whole bunch of items for them. And this lady over here, oh my gosh, that's good, that is so good. This lady over here, that's terrible, it's terrible. So, you know, no matter what you do, you can't make everybody happy. But if you can make the majority happy, you're doing a good job. Utilize your point of sale capabilities. What wasn't on my resume there is, after I was a district manager for 17 stores, 200 employees for five years. I was category manager and merchandiser for almost 400 stores. I was a buyer, one of three buyers at Quick Trip that bought over $1.2 billion in, in goods. And I analyzed all that data because we had the capabilities of making deletion decisions based on slowest items in the category, right? Makes perfect sense. You're going to bring a new item in, Frito-Lay, you're going to lose your slowest item. It's just the way it works. However, new items are the lifeblood of any category. So if you're not introducing an occasional uh, LTO, you'll hear me say, which is limited time offer, uh, you're missing the boat because you need to bring in a super high profit new item occasionally, and then they don't know what the price was. Fred, doesn't, Fred has no idea what you, what you paid for that. If you make 20% food costs or 80% profit, excellent. And Fred can have his beard and move along. So when you do introduce a new item, don't be afraid to make it one of your most profitable items. You know, McCain, which I don't know if you knew this, it's a Wisconsin company. McCain Appetizers are a Wisconsin company. We carry 67 Wisconsin companies, more than Cisco and Reinhardt, in our distribution center. So we're dedicated to Wisconsin as much as anybody out there. McCain is a Wisconsin company that often gives free cases. And free cases are ching, 100% profit, folks. Why wouldn't you take advantage? I know you got a great cheese curd, okay? I know you do. And right now, McCain's got spicy cheese curds and a, yellow, a white cheese curd as a free case. So put them in a, in a sampler platter or you know, don't take away from what you've created or what your customers like, but take advantage of them and make money. It's okay to make money. And I don't think you hear that enough. Uh, so the other thing is, I see I have one customer with an eight-page menu. 
and I'm thinking, looking in their freezer and going, Whew, how long that gyro's meat been, been back in there? Because it's going to get freezer burn going through 47 defrost cycles, right? So don't try to be too much to too many. Be good at what you do, at, at what you make. Keep it fresh and make it better than anyone else. Everybody here have a niche item? Every, everybody here have something that they're famous for? You know, know that you have something, uh, that you have something that, that, hey, if they ask the bartender or the waitress, what are, what's the best thing on the menu? Oh, that's, that's easy. And if you don't have one, I can help you do it. Uh, it's, it's not rocket science. A lot of my ideas are what I call borrowed ideas, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm, raising prices is not a bad thing. Don't feel guilty about it. Don't be afraid to do it. Uh, being an old retail guy, I avoid these two numbers like the plague, 89, and 09. 89 says, I almost made it to 99, but I'm going to leave that dime on the table. 09 says, I've broken the buck, but I'm afraid that 409 is probably going to be the best price after I broke 399. No, it isn't. Please don't do that. There's, there's opportunities in retail at Pick and save, and at Quick Trip, I can tell you this. I have three moves within a dollar. 39, 69, 99. So when you do make your cost or your retail increases on your menu, take a jump, folks. Your cost went up 5%, so don't go up 4%. Go up 8%. That helps cover your increasing costs going forward. Does that make sense? You know, it, I'm not telling you how to price your menu. There's a lot of menus out there. The new thing is to go five and not even put a dollar sign. Just put five or seven or nine. That's fine. Where are you going to go when you've got to increase prices? 550? That's fine. Five and a quarter. But, but take the jump. Don't take little tiny jumps. Go big or sleep in the street. Okay? I mean, take that quarter. Take that 39 cents and, and make money. You know, I, like I said earlier, I do, I do keep an eye on the QSRs and, and items that are trending up. Um, you know, as much trouble as Chipotle's had with uh, bad, what do you call it? Uh, the meat that meat that went bad or pardon? Yeah, well, yeah, they've they've had like three or four incidents where they ended up having recalls on meat and other things and they're still jumping back and getting in the game. They're not afraid to do that. We talked about Arby's already. Panera bread. Um, one thing I do also is I study millennials. I'm very interested in millennials and Generation Zs. I want to understand what they want and need in the restaurant business because they are our future. And Panera Bread is figuring it out faster than anybody. Kiosks to order, right? You can order what you want, how you want it. That's how millennials like it. 52% uh, of millennials will not go in and sit down at your restaurant, 52%. So, you know, they want to eat what they want, where they want, when they want. They will order and pick up sometimes. I bet you you don't have Uber or Grubhub in a lot of your areas, am I right? Actually be thankful. Be thankful, because 30%, they charge up to 30% of <clears throat> your 
food bill or the customer's food bill for hauling that. In a recent survey, 28% of the Grubhub drivers said they have sampled something in the bag. Okay? How come I only got, I only got nine fries? What's, what's going on? Well, if 28% of them admitted it, how many of them actually do it? So we have brought in a red super adhesive strip to put on bags to seal that so that they can't do that anymore. We're not there to, they don't have any skin in the game. They don't care if the thing's upside down. What, you only got seven pieces of pizza? You know, um, they don't care. I mean, they do, I, I'm not speaking for everybody, but again, they don't work for you or the restaurant company, they work for themselves. And by the way, they get a tip. That's great. Thanks for eating half my fries. There's a, a real interesting uh, organization out of, out of Canada called Freshy. Ma Madison had one open by Middleton across from Westtown Mall. That happens to be my wife's favorite place to eat. She's been on the wheat belly diet for about three years. It's much like uh, a keto diet, okay? Low carb, all those wonderful vegetables and things. Um, but Freshies really does a super good job. They are basically solid veggies, uh, a few choice meats like turkey, chicken, uh, that kind of thing. They can make you a vegetarian salad wrap or sandwich. Uh, and surprisingly, they closed. It just blew me away. They closed in Madison. But they're still very much alive. I would model, if I were to open up something in, in a metro area, I would model it after Freshies because they have everything fresh. So they do a nice job. Subway is trying to reinvent itself, and that $5 foot long is still, still haunting them. You know, when you create a song that, that people know, uh, and you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a subway sign, uh, that's a bad analogy, but <laughs> that's, that's the farm boy in me. Um, Anyway, they created that monster themselves, and I listened to some PhDs talk in Chicago about, about Subway and how they are going to fight that seven years ago. And they are still fighting it. And in a, in a low carb world with a gigando bun, you know, it's not, they have to reinvent themselves. One little known fact, did you know that, that most of the meats other than the beef, are all made out of turkey at Subway. Ham is turkey. Turkey's turkey. Uh, they, they did it to be, say they did it to be healthy, they actually did it to be cheap. So, what I did and what I do is and I know this is hard to see, probably even harder on your PowerPoint presentation. Um, sorry about that. <clears throat> but as a consultant, if I want to know, I go to La Crosse and I go to Panera Bread and I will ask, I actually like to use, you know, cashiers and stuff like that. Crazy, I know, but um, I won't use the kiosk. I'll, I'll actually go up to the front counter. And I'll say, what's your number one selling sandwich? Well, it's a bacon turkey bravo. Okay, cool. What kind of bread do you recommend? And they'll tell you everything you need to know. So if I come to your restaurant and say, and you say, Don, I'm looking for a new healthier sandwich, what do you think I'm going to recommend? I'll even buy one take it home, dissect it, put it on my scale, understand how much meat they're putting in, understand, I mean, the mayo and some of the other things kind of get a little ugly. Uh, 
but I do want to understand exactly what they got in it. I do the same thing at Perkins, which drives me absolutely crazy, because I know they got seven cents in an egg. Okay, they're charging me $7.99 for that wonderful two egg and, and bacon breakfast, and it costs them about 83 cents. Uh, and they get $3 for an orange juice, and I'm, I'm doing all this cost analysis in my head, and I'm going, this is not even fair. Uh, but they do a good job, and you can't take it away from them. They're not afraid to make money, and they're still going. So, you know, a lot of the menus anymore from these number one uh, QSRs are online for you. They're actually out there and you can, you can peruse their menus and a lot of people say, Don, this is just too much, you know, I mean, my, my people aren't going to want to do a Napa almond chicken salad or a blueberry feta salmon salad, that's just too much. You'd be surprised. You know, un until you, and I'm not, I, I would never ever suggest as an X category manager, I'm not going to say, we're going to clean your menu off and start over. That's absolutely stupid. Keep the best of the best items that you've always done well and leave room for a keto item, keto friendly item. Leave room for an ancient grain item, quinoa, flaxseed. Uh, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but. Uh, it's out of, we started working with a company called In Harvest out of Bemidji, Minnesota, way, way up north. And they, uh, they have some great stuff. They have five or six chefs, and we had one come and present to us on the culinary team. California is kind of a little bit ahead of us in some areas. They've been giving serving their K through 12 these ancient grain mixes for several years. It's not new to them. It's new to us. You know, and it sounds like ancient grains. Um, no, call it ruby wild rice, ruby red wild rice, or whatever, you know, whatever's in it. Wild rice is actually, um, it, it's always in Minnesota been one of the top selling soups. In Wisconsin, it's starting to gain legs. So chicken wild rice is a very popular. And if you want to get to where QSRs are at, their goal for 2020 is to have a 25% food cost, 75% profit. How are they going to do that? Less meat, less bread, more other things. Other things being grains. Bowls are super popular. If you look here, there's, there's several bowls. Uh, they have a quinoa, a lentil quinoa bowl with chicken. Uh, and a cage-free egg. I love that. <laughs> cage-free and open or range Free range, free range chickens. We have three farms by us that have free range chickens. 10,000 chickens in a 150 foot shed, 12 of them are outside free range and the rest of them are all inside. <laughs> so don't, don't talk to me about free range chickens, please. So, you know, what's, oh, you owe me 10 bucks. What's trending up right now? You know, people want to say gluten-free. You can't say gluten-free in your restaurant. If you don't have a specific area blocked off, air-tempered, air that has no exposure to gluten items, then you can't call yourself gluten-free. Please call yourself gluten-friendly. Gluten-friendly are, you know, we're, um, I create proprietary pizza programs, and I'm going to do that for a microbrewery here in another week. I just talked to my Riches rep, and they recently 
or over a year now, I've had cauliflower and broccoli crust. They have a sweet potato and zucchini crust coming out now. So we're working with, oh, I say too much. You're not my customer yet. Um, and I did say yet. Low carb, that's not going to go away. You know, low carb is going to be there because carbs turn into sugar and sugar turns into fat. And I are fat. <laughs> Sustainable foods, mark my words, there's going to be cricket flour and grasshopper flour someday. Organic is still popular. We're close to Organic Valley. If you've heard of Organic Valley, that's where it started over in our area. And they have done nothing but, holy cow, but grow. And, uh, but as an ex-farmer, I can say that when you have a shelf-stable milk for 45 days, you did something to it. You boiled the bejesus out of it in order to get that to sit, and you know what I mean, um, on a shelf for 45 days. When I, I used to dip out of the bulk tank and bring it to the refrigerator. <laughs> so I'm, I'm still trying to absorb that one. Local, you know, there's nothing wrong with local. Any, any salesperson that calls on you that if a guy's got strawberries locally, buy them from him. If a, if a person has, you know, local beef or burger that you can use on your menu, the biggest mistake people make is they buy local meats and burgers and they don't tell anybody about it. Make sure their logo is on your menu so that you uh, give them credit and take credit for using local. How am I doing on time here? I got to be careful. Plant-based meats. That's an oxymoron. You know, um, there are, Burger King bought up, bought the company that made, made uh, the Impossible Burger. I don't know if you knew that, but their fourth quarter was up. Their first quarter is down. So it's kind of very likely going to be faddish. And there are other companies that are coming out with more plant-based burgers for you. Uh, my only concern, I make plant-based burgers out of ancient grains, not out of chemicals, OK? I mean, we used to, everybody's tried the black bean burger. You know, the black bean is, is uh, a good item, relatively inexpensive. I've used portobello mushrooms. And the problem is, if you don't use up your supply of portobello mushrooms, you're either throwing them away or, or doing the next best thing, which is cutting them into strips, breading them, and deep frying them, because they're really good. <laughs> kind of goes from healthy to not so much. So plant-based meats, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to see those. There is a company uh, called Cary, K-E-R-R-Y, out of Beloit, Wisconsin, that makes plant-based shreds. It looks like shredded meat. And over the holidays, I had a, a couple pound bag of that. So just for fun and to torture my kids, I, I put in... Uh, green peppers and taco seasoning and made tacos. None of them guessed it was plant-based. So, you know, it is, it is possible to get by with it. Um, I like to see a Wisconsin company do well. So, anyway, uh, we're still going to continue to see that. It'll be interesting to see how much your customers ask for things like that. Because I know a lot of the decisions that you make as owners, uh, managers, that kind of thing, if you hear the same thing from a half a dozen customers, guess what? You might want to think about doing it, trying it, or appeasing them a little bit. 
You still run the place and own the place, but they can be an influence. We talked about ancient grains, and there's a thing now called sprouted grains. So they're taking these grains and hydroponically putting them in some kind of floating device on the water. And as soon as those grains start to sprout, as soon as that little tiny green plant starts coming out of that seed, that hard shell breaks off the outside, they harvest them. That changes the texture of that grain from hard to palatable. So you'll see sprouted grains also. And it actually, you know, adds a little flavor. Because grains by themselves, these in-harvest grains are not seasoned, not salted, no sodium. I mean, they, you give it the flavor that, that it takes on. In fact, I'll just real quickly explain something to you. On ancient grains, there's a two pound bag that it comes in. You would mix 40 ounces of chicken broth with that grain. Bake it for 20 minutes, you, and it sucks it up like grape nuts. How many of us had grape nuts before, right? It sucks that chicken broth up like mad, and there is your rice bowl for the next day or two. Quick to fix, heat it as you need it, lasts for at least five days. I, you know, it's seven days legally, but we recommend five. You could have a pork tenderloin bowl one day, uh, a chicken with black beans and red peppers and, and uh, cilantro the next day as a chicken bowl, right? So you can use that same base for more than one bowl. Guess what your featured item is? It's an LTO. Guess how much you're going to make on it? 80%. Because that grain breaks down to 10 cents an ounce. 10 cents an ounce is cheap food. One of the, my claims to fame or the thing that I'm glad I got to do is the largest truck stop in the world is a customer of ours. It's in the Quad Cities. They have a 50-foot buffet and salad bar. I have analyzed every ounce of everything that goes in and out of that salad bar. So I come the day before, and they're mixing up the meatloaf in a 120-pound blender. Uh, and I, I take all the recipes and break them down in cost. And then the kids are what amazes me. And I, again, I'm calling kids. I'm sorry, the younger peoples. But they will take, let's say the ranch dressing is running out, and it's in a Cambro container, right? And they know it needs to be replaced. So what do they do? They take the Cambro container off the salad bar, and they run it back and give it to the dishwasher, and give a, bring a new container full of ranch out. What should they be doing? Bring the full one out, use a crazy thing called a spatula, and, and clean that six to eight ounces of ranch dressing, okay, at seven cents an ounce, because they make it themselves, put it on top, rotate, and not waste that. So I found out when they were bringing things back that they, they waste, that's where the waste comes from. So it, it was kind of interesting, but then they do over 700 buffets a day. That's a lot of truck drivers to put through there. Excuse me, and they have a full menu with a large restaurant. So interestingly enough, the waitresses that have been there, some of them have been there almost 30 years. They make good money. The, Kitchen help and buffet people, turn them like water. But same problem everybody else has, right? The next area, vegetarian items. Love vegetarians. And it's coming and it's not going to go away. 
you know, I was born to be a meat eater. I'm sorry, I'm not, I try to eat salads. I really do. I'm diabetic. I had a heart attack at 43. I, I'm not a healthy man, but I'm trying to be. But if you don't offer anything on your entire menu that isn't fried or, you know, flat grilled, I'm going to have a hard time eating there. Just be, or I'll take the bun off the chicken breast sandwich or something like that if I have to. But I never dreamed I'd be, I'd be heading toward items like these. This one is really tough. Vegan, straight vegan is so tough because Wisconsin is a cheese state. They don't eat cheese. They can't have dressing with milk in it. You know, so it's, it's really kind of tough. But guess what those ancient grains are? Vegan qualified. Not with chicken broth. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Not with chicken Not broth. Not with chicken broth, you're right. <laughs> they have to do it with water. But what does water do for you? Get your cost down. <laughs> so that's okay. Uh, items that are probiotic. Uh, Oh boy, I spelled charcuterie wrong. That's, that's a bad deal. My mom would be so mad. Um, probiotic items that are, help you actually be um, more healthy, right? I mean, they're, they're saying grapes are or whatever, whatever those items may be. Charcuterie, wow. I cannot believe I butchered that word that bad. I'm ashamed of myself. Charcuterie starting to come back a little bit. We have a restaurant in Madison that, that does a lot with Italian meats and cheeses. Charcuterie's cool because you can't do it wrong. You, you can do it in a jumbo pretzel with the cheeses and the meats that you have and add, you know, grapes or nuts or, or other things. Um, so charcuterie is kind of cool and millennials like to share appetizers, shareable meals. So if you do have them in there, and they aren't as particular as you might think in, the, in that $12.99 for a giant pretzel with three different kinds of cheese and two different Italian meats. That seems like a lot. They don't blink an eye because they got money or they think they do. <laughs> I used to have money, but anyway, so charcuterie, charcuterie is another opportunity um, that, that makes a trip back and it's perceived healthy. You know, thin sliced meats, uh, we might add some hot pepper bacon jam, uh, an olive medley of some kind. We can create using whatever you have in your kitchen already, plus a few items, and come up with a nice proprietary charcuterie tray for you. So, money to be made. What is the enemy of profitability? Over portioning. Over portioning, I'm going to give you a quick example of a bowling alley that makes, that's famous for pizzas. They might do 25 to 40 pizzas a day, 12 to 16 inch. I, I bought a scale on purpose many years ago because scaling is so important in this business. And we had four people make a pizza, the same pizza at that restaurant, at that bowling alley. And we weighed and reset to zero every time they put an ingredient on, right? In the, we understood the lowest cost pizza that was made by the owner and the highest cost pizza that was made, somebody who didn't care quite as much, and with their volume of averaging 30 pizzas a day, it would average over $25,000 more the way the person didn't care so much, just in cheese. Some people are tipped, remember, by the way that they make something for you. I'm going to wait till Herman 
comes because he always makes me a great pizza. I bet he does. But it's at your expense. And, you know, the same way with appetizers. I'm a huge believer in, at, at, at Quick Trip, before cameras, and I'm old, we had a one-way mirror and a booth that you entered from the outside to watch your employees before their performance reviews. Second shift and third shift. You entered the building from the outside, sat on two milk crates, and watched your employees um, and how they worked. As a manager that worked 10 hours to 11, 12 hours a day, the more I sat in there, the more my blood pressure went up because they, they had more time than, you know. So point being, sometimes your second shift, when you're there, everybody runs like machines. They're really good. When you leave, Lord only knows what happens. Do they have time to pre-portion appetizers? Dang right they do. You know, when cheese curds are 28 cents an ounce, you need to pre-portion. You need, you, it takes literally five minutes to pre-portion one full bag of cheese curds, and so all they have to do is grab that bag and throw it in the fryer, and it's the same serving every time. <clears throat> Bad plating or prep. Bless you. Um, putting something out that doesn't look good. And it, it does happen because with our wonderful, these great phones, guess what happens? It can be the best of times and the worst of times. Look at this burger. It's fantastic. I got it at your restaurant. And then look at this burger. Can you believe they served it this way? So, you know, that can, that can haunt you or help you. Yelp, a lot of other things. Low quality, and being, being a consultant, again, I'm, w you can buy your way to profitability or you can sell your way there. I would prefer you sold your way there because quality comes up on a list of consumers' needs higher than retail price. Everybody get that? You know, price, when you give a quality item, price is less important to them. When you give a low quality item, doesn't really matter the price, they go, those sucked, I won't buy those again. <clears throat> Under training staff, everybody's guilty, everybody. Unless you have <clears throat> uh, some kind of a DVD training situation in your business, that everybody's trained consistently, but boy, that's tough. We end up throwing them to the wolves before they're ready. And that can be a waitress, that can be a cook, that can be, you know, any position in your restaurant. And under training staff actually leads to turnover. They didn't tell me what they wanted. They didn't tell me what they wanted to do. Those of us that were raised on a farm and are baby boomers, did we question what our dad said when, when he did it? Hell no, we didn't, we just did it. Do they do that now? Uh-uh. They gotta understand why they're doing it. What's the benefit for them for doing it? What is the goal, what is the end goal for me for doing it? And Lord knows, I mean, I would have to pray for patience before I started training somebody. Because you just, you want them to understand, and you really have to be in a mindset when you're training, because I see a lot of lead follower get the hell out of the way in the restaurant business, right? If you're not doing it fast enough, you're gonna move them to the side and let me take over. That's not great training. Not using leftovers on time. You know, I come from a grab and go world. So I create sandwiches, salads, wraps, for bistros, for delis, for restaurants, for convenience stores, for grocery stores. If they don't sell it, you know, we've got to find some way to get rid of it legally without wasting it, and I'll explain that. If you're going to make a, a let's say if you have a, a deli in your campground and you make 
meat and cheese sandwiches, but you also have the ability to make hot sandwiches, either through, a, doesn't matter, an impinger oven, a turbo chef, a, you know, whatever. You have the ability to heat that sandwich and sell it as a hot item the day it, it expires. Does that make sense? So you didn't sell it as a cold item, but now you're gonna sell it as a warm item and not have spoilage on it. I, I just, I try to prevent spoilage. My job is to make you more money. Here's a big one, never changing anything. I've been this way, I worked with a chef, I graduated in 1978. This man started as a chef at this restaurant in 1976. It is so hard to get him to try anything new. It really is, because what he's done has always worked, right? And he'll actually get mad at me. He likes me, but he gets mad at me for introducing new items to him because he didn't, he didn't want to change anything. So, <clears throat> and again, working in retail, every new, new items come out in retail virtually daily. People ask for a catalog from Martin Brothers, you know, what do you got in there? Well, we got 13,000 items of food. Well, do you have a catalog? Nope. Because we might bring in 10 items in one day and delete six items the next day and that, that catalog wouldn't be accurate. So we do have online capabilities and business to business website, but <clears throat> anyway, poor service. Poor service will hurt you, um, and you can't grow a personality on people. If, if you don't have a personality, it's going to be very difficult to... Some people are great in the front of the house and should be there, and some people should be in the back of the house because they're just not that high five and thanks for coming in, gosh, I'm glad you, you're here today um, kind of person. So. Putting the right person in the right position is important. Which of all of these are controllable expenses? Everyone. We used to have meetings with our store managers from Quick Trip and we'd talk about controllable and uncontrollable expenses. And at some point, and we'd compare. I'm a big believer in best practices. If you're very successful in your restaurant and you're struggling, and I don't mean to, you know, if, if I can bring some ideas from him to you that have been successful, and you say, you know what, I'm gonna try that, then you've gained something. Non-competing restaurants, obviously, but, you know, there, there is a thing called best practices. I wish the government would use that sometimes. Even counties and cities, you know, you, I won't go political on you, but um, I want to make sure we got seven minutes. So, Friends of Profitability, real quickly, free product, take advantage of it, 100% profit. Making retail changes as the cost changes on menu items. I have customers that have brown paper on a roll that roll their menu and their specials down on that, on that roll. I, chalkboards are continuing to be a place for a small menu. Great idea. I do digital menus and we can create the ones that would plug, you can get a 40 inch TV now for $129, plug in your menu into the USB port and that digital menu you could change tomorrow if you wanted to. It's your hard menus that are hard to change. So, a lot of opportunities out there. Pre-portioning ingredients, pricing new items and LTOs at a 20% food cost or 80% profit. Try it. See what happens. You can't pick filet mignon and, and you're, be at 80%, all right? You're gonna have to do something with either free or buy, buy one, get one free products, something like that. 
using the same fresh ingredients and in multiple items, key to keeping your prep table, you know, fresh. You don't want to give somebody crappy lettuce, a crappy tomato, etc. Retaining good people, treating them well, and caring about them. Uh, the next seminar is me also with my equipment guy. We don't start till 9.45. It is 9.25 right now. So I talk a lot, I know that, but I got so much to tell you. So right now I would be glad to field any questions that you might have from anything I have said. Well, that's a good question, uh, and it depends on the item. Like, I, I'm making the meal, my team is making the meal tonight. I'm guessing, I'm guessing that you won't eat over four ounces of potato salad and you won't eat over four ounces of pepper slaw. Uh, I do a combined combined ounces for a large meal like catering is a different calculation than you know eight ounce eight ounces of food go ahead you know I use five ounces okay french fries are six cents an ounce or you use six you know that's fine whatever you do do consistently and guess what one of the most most profitable items in your house should be french fries, french fries. <laughs> taters are cheap so I think that the appetizer to answer your question on appetizers and that kind of thing five ounces is where I go because and I use a small boat mm -hmm. when you use a big tray with the with the paper in it five ounces looks like it's lost and doesn't know where to you know hide in that bowl on the other hand if you do it use an eight ounce an eight ounce plaid uh, appetizer tray, it looks full. Make it look full. It's a good question. Next. You guys know almost everything? I don't, I don't know everything. I'm learning every day. Every day I learn. Well, you're talking about a 33.3% food cost then, or 66% profit. Um, that's that's going to leave you at about a 35, you know, 35% food cost. And if you can live on that, that's fine. Um, the restaurant industry is 30% food cost, which is 70% profit. If you're in a deli. Or you know you're you're just making simple simple stuff. A lot of delis are at about a 50% profit, clear after spoilage, after everything. So if that makes sense, yes, sir. You know I've struggled with food costs in the campground business for 40 years. I always seem to be around 54% cost of goods sold because you look at demographics and you say you know I'm not at Disney World I'm not paying eight bucks for a hamburger I'm gonna pay five bucks for a hamburger at a campground because the guy comes in he's got four kids so four kids at six people to sit down and eat he's gonna be 30 to 50 bucks to have lunch in a campground he's not coming in but spent 50 bucks so I'm always struggling with okay what will he pay right and that's where I keep that 54 percent I just can't get down at 30, 33% because he's not going to buy it. And, and my answer to that is two things. Look at what McDonald's, everybody else is charging for a burger right now. Just because people are paying it. Secondly, keep your burger where you are, but add higher profit items as either sides or desserts or, you know, something incremental that you can do above and beyond your burger. I make more money on ice cream than any damn thing. There you go, and you should. I mean, that's just a no-brainer. Yes, absolutely. And, and 
guess what? I have an ice cream seminar at 2 o'clock. So I love seminars. I really do. I, I enjoy what I do. Me and food are pretty tight. So any other questions for me? And I, I do have business cards with me if for any reason. And I will be here at the show. We'll have two booths at the show. Um, if if it, you just want to pop some questions at me, you know, during the show, that's perfectly fine. I'll be glad to do it. And if you'd like, I, I cover the state of Wisconsin, so if you'd like me to come and look at your operation, I, I don't charge anything to do that. Um, you know, but we do, obviously, I have to pay for myself somehow, so uh, we would obviously want a chunk of your business. I'm not going to lie to you about that. Uh, if you've got a vendor you're not super happy with and you'd like one to be super happy with, then we're your guys. Do you do a lot of smaller restaurants? Because that's been an issue. We, I know a lot of people in the room used to use like uh, Dirk's Waukesha. Right. And then U.S. Foods bought it out. Right. U.S. Foods not interested in small businesses and so a lot of us have been scrambling on food vendors so do you have a lot of big case minimums are you going after those smaller places do you only need the big universities of wisconsin <laughs> yeah we'd love 14 million dollar customers um <laughs> however to answer that we do have a minimum mm -hmm. okay we understand if you can hit 750 in the summer even if it's every other week we are interested in talking to you We've got to pay for our driver and the drop. And so that's a great question. And, and I, you know, some people say, oh, they have no Indian head, you know, cut off a, a bunch of customers. That probably was a smart business move for them. If they were only doing 300 a week, it's very difficult to, uh, but, you know, between Jansan, uh, paper towels, napkins, it isn't that hard to, to get to hit 750. If you're open during the winter and you're hitting 500, you know, again, we can live with that. We're not going to fire you as a customer because of that. But it does cost us about $75 a drop for every semi, and we make an average of 10%. I'll, I'll, so if we're not doing 750, we're losing money. And I'm teaching people how to make money. I can't go against myself and say, eh, no problem, we'll, we'll drop 200 bucks off for you. We, we can work on things, you know, uh, and I love small businesses. They're my faves because I like people and, and I like to help people. So I hope that's a fair answer, but it's a great question. Anything else? D did you have, if you would fill out a survey for us, please, on how you felt the seminar went today. Uh, Hopefully you got some nuggets to take back with you. I know you're going to have a lot of nuggets because <laughs> it's, it's uh, several days on the show. But anyway, I appreciate you coming very much. Thank you for being here.